Welcome back to Before the Day Ends. We are now in session 17, and we're still in the Gospel of Matthew's first book. Uh, we said there's five books in the Gospel of Matthew. We're in the first book, the second half of the first book. And we've been exploring the new covenant, or actually renewed covenant, that Jesus is making with us, his disciples. Uh, we've talked last couple weeks about how this is a not a Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5-7, through 7, rather it is a renewed covenant. As Moses went up on Mount Sinai, Jesus goes up on the Mount in uh, the Beatitudes in Capernaum, and there he's going to teach. And this teaching really is this agreement, this contract, this covenant between Jesus and us. Now, like any contract or any covenant, there are multiple parts to that. The first part is the description of who's involved. And so last time we talked about who God is and how God presents himself to us. In the Mosaic Covenant, it was, I am the God who rescued you from Egypt. In this chapter, what we're going to see is Jesus is going to define God by how he sees the world. So, blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are those who mourn. That's how God sees us and kind of defines who God is. We're moving on now to verse 13 of chapter 5 to look at, who we are. How does Jesus see us? So, in the Mosaic Covenant, it was those who were rescued from Egypt. So God says, I'm the one who brought you out of Egypt. You were the slaves, I rescued you. Now we're going to see how Jesus sees us as part of this contract, this covenant. So join me in Matthew 5.13. You are the salt of the earth. But if the salt has lost its taste, how can its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything, but is thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A city built on a hill cannot be hid. No one, after lighting a lamp, puts it under the bushel basket, but on the lampstand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. Now, before we go too far, I want you to notice that this is all plural. Yes, we, me, you, are to be the light of the world and salt of the earth. True. But here in this text, it's talking to the community of God's people. It is, in fact, plural. So, y'all are supposed to be the salt of the earth. And y'all are supposed to be the light of the world. And I've seen this in, in recently in a, in a couple of sermons I've listened to, that sometimes we get confused on when it's singular and plural. And, and I want to point out that this is, in fact, plural. Now, why salt? Salt of the earth. Well, salt had many uses in the uh, ancient Near East. Purification, sanctification, it was a sign of wisdom, and in many ways it was a sign of covenant. So in like Numbers and Leviticus, we see covenant being associated with salt. So it had many, many uses. But here, I think it's the bigger issue is, how does salt lose its taste? Well, in the first century, salt was mixed with other minerals. And so if salt leached out of those minerals, what did you have left? Well, you had dirt. So the salt had to be present within the minerals to be salty. It wasn't pure like we have salt in our salt shakers today, but it had to be there. And we, as God's people, need to be there. It's not just being at church and going to church or, or doing the things by yourself. We need to be present in the world doing things for Christ, for them. So salt has to be salty, and people have to recognize that it's, in fact, salty in the world itself. Okay, light. Well, we know light has many, many connotations in the Bible. Um, Gospel of John uses it a lot. Um, the first thing that God does is separate light and darkness. So light is this idea of truth, revelation, wisdom. And here again, it's its present. Right? We don't take a light or a candle and put it under a bowl. And by the way, this wasn't to put out the candle. It was to hide it. So these baskets were big, sometimes as big as nine liters. So it wasn't putting out the flame, it was just hiding it. And it's not useful if it's being hid. We put it on the lampstand, we put it where it could be seen, and that's what's going on here. We are to be useful and 
bringing light into dark places. It doesn't do us much good to be light in light places. We need to bring light to dark places. And Jesus is going to do that throughout his ministry. In fact, the church is defined by that. The church isn't just to get together and sing songs or listen to sermons and do stuff for ourselves. We are to be involved in dark places. In fact, Ephesians chapter 3, Paul is say, says this. He says, the church, the church is to be the wisdom of God in its rich variety as being made known to rulers and authorities in heavenly places. So we have this idea that the church is supposed to be involved and active in the world. So what does it mean to be salt and light? It means we're to be involved, active, so the world can see that we are, in fact, salt and light and present. Before I finish off today, I want to just go back to one more thing. In verse 17, we have this interesting statement that I want to kind of flesh out a little bit for you. Verse 17, Now do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish, but to fulfill. For truly I tell you, until heaven and earth pass away, not one letter, not one stroke of a letter will pass away from the law until all is accomplished. Okay, so what I want to point out here is that Jesus is kind of saying, look, this isn't going to be a brand new covenant. It's a renewed covenant. But I want to point out kind of as an exploration of this text, this idea of the law and the prophets. Why does he mention those two? But if you remember, very early on, we talked about the fact that the Bible in Jesus' day and for the Jewish population today is in three sections. The Torah, the instruction, the first five books of Moses, read in Hebrew in synagogue today. The prophets, the Nevim, which are, you know, Isaiah, Jeremiah, and so forth. And then the writings, the third part, the Ketuvim, and that would be Psalms, Proverbs, uh, Daniel's in there, First and Second Chronicles is in there. So of those three, the most important of those three was the Law, the Torah, and the Prophets, the Nevim. And like you will see later on um, in the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus is on the Mount of Transfiguration with two folks, Moses, representing the Law, and Elijah, representing the prophets. So again, two very, very important parts of the Bible that was critical to them uh, and still are today. So the law and the prophets uh, kind of encompass this idea of God's instruction. Okay, going back to light and uh, salt and being present. Uh, when I was in Jerusalem a long time ago, um, I went into a little shop where you buy antiquities and things like that. And, and I saw an oil lamp. It was in a box with some other things. It wasn't really like set out to the side. It was a 2,000-year-old oil lamp. This is it right here. And I bought it. And it wasn't very expensive. Um, and here's why. If you look at this, and you can see it there, it's misshapen. It's, it's off-center. It's been used. You can tell it's got a dark marks from it. Um, but it's off-shape. Uh, it's got some cracks in the back. It's got a big ridge here. It's just, it's not a, a good-looking lamp. Um, and I looked at this lamp, and I thought, you know, the fact that it's around still says something. But the fact that it exists. Because if you think about it, if you're making a lamp and you made it wrong and it didn't get the impression right and it's crooked, you probably just throw it in the scrap heap and make a new one. So why was this lamp still around? So I began to think, and, and I kind of attached a story to it, at least for myself. I had to think in some ways that maybe a child made it. And a child brought it to the parent and said, hey, I, I made this lamp. And the parent did not, I don't know what the parent did, I don't know what the parent did not do. The parent did not take the lamp and toss it on the scrap heap and say, go back and you need to try that again. He took the lamp and put it on a lampstand and let it give light to everyone in the house. It's not a perfect lamp, and neither are we. But despite our imperfection, God wants to put us on the lampstand and let the light that he shines through us shine to the world. So, again, we're not perfect. I'm not perfect. We make a lot of mistakes. I make a ton of mistakes. But still, God in His mercy and His grace takes our imperfections and allows His light to shine through us. Hope you have a great day, and we'll see you next time.